Somebody was telling us, uh, perhaps it was a couple of years ago, that they had a visitor, either from Eastern Europe or from perhaps it was the developing part of the world, who they took with them uh, to their weekly shop at the local big supermarket, who, ending up in a particular aisle, looked with amazement and said... Why do you need so many varieties of toilet rolls? I was in a gathering last week when somebody said something very similar about the churches. Why do you need so many varieties? In our Bible study, what we're going to look at is not the whole of chapters 12 to 13, but just the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 12. So I hope you've got the passages with you, and perhaps also a New Testament, but at least the passage in your resource book. And we're going to look at it slowly and carefully and take our time soaking into this passage and listening to the resonances within it. As we need do so, we need to remember that this comes from a letter, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, to a particular place in a particular time. Paul did not write a systematic theology, <coughs> neither did he compose anything like that volume so beloved by Methodists, <laughs> the constitutional practice and discipline of the Methodist church. Although some might be surprised to know he didn't write such a volume. <laughs> And as we read that letter, we need to think, in a sense, how we feel when, if we do do such things, we read someone else's letter to another place. We are, as it were, eavesdropping on the particular needs and anxieties and the concerns of a particular place. Those of you who know Paul's correspondence with Corinth will know that it was by no means a straightforward relationship. He had a troubled relationship with that church there in Corinth. As he wrestled with them, and they were by no means a passive community, as he wrestled with them, trying to interpret what the gospel of Christ, what in terms of what we're talking about at this conference, what love requires of us, what it meant in that particular place, at that particular time. So he's not writing something which is prescriptive. We don't have to match ourselves in each detail by what he says. But he moves from the particular to celebrate the general of what this says about the gospel of Christ. Think of 1 Corinthians 13. And then he moves back again to the particular, to what that means for that particular community. And in a sense, that's a journey that we also need to be making. From the particular of where we are to what we learn or discover or apply from the gospel of Christ, and then back to the particular again once more. And so he starts... Now, concerning. Whoops, back again. I think this is going to work. There we are. Now, concerning. Already in chapter 7, Paul had said, Now, concerning about which you, the things about which you wrote, the matters about which you wrote. In the letter, he picks up time and time again things which are sub subjects that were already on their minds, that arise out of the context, things that they had written to him about, perhaps not things that he had prepared himself to talk about. For example, now concerning virgins, now concerning food sacrificed to idols. And we shouldn't imagine that they'd just written to him, hey, Paul, what do we do about virgins? What do we do about food sacrifice to idols? I suspect that they told him what they were doing about them. And he had to say, yes, but. 
And so as we listen to his voice in what the passages that we're going to listen to, we've got to him, uh, hear him saying, yes, but. And we do really have to listen and hear because we have to remember that if you were the first congregation in Corinth, then 90% of you could not read. Is that me thumping? No? 90% of you could not read. Now you can decide among yourselves which are the 10% and which are the 90%. But so you would rely on hearing. And you can imagine Paul's messenger the first time bringing this letter and reading it and the tone of voice carrying something of what he knew that Paul was wanting to say. Now, concerning. I do not want you to be, in your translation, uninformed, or I do not want you to be without knowledge. That's going to have a few more resonances in a moment, it may well have an element of irony. Paul says the same sort of thing in other places. He says it in chapter 10, in that peculiar passage where he talks about the rock which followed the, the Israelites as they went through the wilderness. I do not want you to be without knowledge, because I'm just about to tell you something which is really difficult. He says the same thing in Romans 11. I do not want you to be without knowledge, this mystery, so that you do not uh, be what you... Let me read what I'm saying. That you do not be wiser than you are. I'm about to tell you something that you might think you know the answers to, but perhaps you don't really. Uh, that's what's going on in all that. This was a church, probably, which thought that they had knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8, that concerning again, concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all have knowledge. And perhaps there we can almost hear the Corinthians claiming. And then Paul punctures that. Knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. What? does love require of us? And so once having put them in the place perhaps of learners and listeners, those who have to begin to question the knowledge that they have, he starts where he's going, concerning spiritual. And this is already where you get your red pens out. And although I asked for the new revised standard version to be printed, you can start crossing out some bits in it. It does not say now concerning spiritual gifts. The translators are making too many decisions for you and they're getting there too far. Concerning spiritual. Spiritual what? In fact, it's ambiguous. And those of you who have Bibles with footnotes we'll find a footnote which says, or persons. Because it could be now concerning spiritual persons. Was this what some claimed to be? Remember where we were in the last slide with chapter 8, verse 1. All have knowledge. Or perhaps we have all knowledge. We are the spiritual ones. We are the ones who've got a direct line to God. We are the ones who are tuned to what God wants. And a minute, Paul is going to say, hang on a moment. As he said in chapter 8, not everyone does have knowledge of the sort of knowledge that you are talking about or you think that you have. Indeed, earlier on in his letter, he had told them that, in fact, he could not speak to them as if they were spiritual people. He had to speak to them as if they were fleshly people, something that could well have made them begin to feel more than a little bit annoyed 
because in Paul's rhetoric, fleshly is actually not where you want to be, not how you want to be described. Not simply as he's saying, I can't yet speak to you as the mature and the educated, he's, he's implying that they still have their minds where their mind should not quite yet be. We know that there were, in the early church a little bit later, those who indeed did claim to be spiritual, to be an elite within the life of the church. Perhaps by birth, perhaps by some divine blessing, but nonetheless to be superior. So maybe Paul has something to say about that sort of outlook. Or is he saying concerning spiritual things? Spiritual things that are available to all or spiritual things that are claimed by a few? This may well be what seems to fit within the context of the letter. Because as he goes on within the letter, particularly when you get later to chapter 14, you find that he is actually talking about spiritual things. That perhaps spiritual things are the question or the issue that they wrote about. And if it is spiritual things that are the question or the issue that they wrote about, note what he does with it. He introduces it at the beginning of chapter 12, as we've just seen. But then he drops it. And he goes on apparently talking about other things for the rest of chapter 12. And then he goes into chapter 13 with that great hymn to love. And only then does he come back in chapter 14 to that question of spiritual things. And then he qualifies it. But rather, so that you may flourish. And not only does he do that, he then immediately goes on in the next verse to stop the language of spirit and to talk about speaking with a tongue which whatever we may associate that phrase with, is in its basic components really quite mundane. We all speak with a tongue. We all speak with a language. He is, as it were, puncturing that exalted claim about what some people were, some people were doing and saying, let's call it for what it is. Let's put it in its place. So what Paul has done is that he has started with the issue either that they have asked him about or that he has picked up from the claims and the assertions and the boasts that they are making. He has started from where they are with their questions or their weaknesses or their problems. And then he goes off to chapters 12 and 13 that you're concentrating on throughout this next couple of days. He goes off to the wider things of exploring what it means to be part of Christ's body. He goes into that great hymn of love. And only then does he bring it back to where they are and to their issues and to their situation. And then suddenly they have to see their issues and their situation in a rather different sort of context. How does it look like now? How are you going to think about it now? So let's look at this again. He started picking up perhaps their language concerning Spiritual. Spiritual, if I put the Greek into English, pneumatica. Think of a pneumatic tire full of spirit or wind or air 
uh, or whatever you might think. And in a minute, he's going to go on, and this is why the New Revised Standard Version has got it wrong and is moving on too quickly. Because the first line does not say concerning spiritual gifts, it says concerning spiritual. Whether it is, as we've seen, people or things. And then in verse 4, he will go on to talk not about spiritual, but about gifts, charismata. And if the language of pneumatica meant a lot to them and not much to us, we have to be careful because the language of charismatic may mean a lot to us that it did not mean to them. So we need to get rid of those associations that we might have of the charismatic, which might be closer to what they meant by the pneumatic, and listen to the word charismata, which purely and simply means gifts. Gifts. And by moving what from the pneumatica, from what may for some have asserted who they were and what they were and what type of people they were or what type of things they had now puts them as recipients, as those who have received gifts. And gifts, as we'll see as this chapter works it out, in a very particular sense. Again, sometimes we use gifts in a very sort of general way. She has a gift for putting her foot in it. Or she has a gift for art. But in this chapter, what Paul means by gifts is not those things that we have been blessed with by birth, by God's creative activity through nature and through inheritance, but through the particular that is given to us as members of the body of Christ, as believers in Christ, given by God. We are there as recipients, as those who have what we have only because it has been given, not because it is ours by right. Paul changes the language and gives them a new vocabulary, which means that they will have to rethink what it is they are claiming and what they are talking about. And so he goes on to explore what we're talking about when we're talking about these gifts. What is it that we have of gifts? The New Revised Standard Version translate as varieties. Variety. But that, I think, is far too bland a translation. So out comes your red pen again. Because a variety makes me think rather like a box of Quality Street or Cadbury's Roses. And there's something of the luck of the draw when you put your hand in it and what comes out. And they're a bit of a medley and you can never tell what is in there or quite why the manufacturers have chosen what they have. But the word that the NRSV translates as variety could be translated as distributions, which would give it a rather different feel because you then think of allocations and of rather like gifts, it coming from somewhere. It could have within it the idea of diversity, the differentness or difference of the title that I've given what I'm talking about, which is there in variety, but rather more sharply there in the word diversity, which makes you think of both sameness and of difference. It could even catch the idea of 
division. Although we may be rather uncomfortable in this context with the language of division. Listen to the word variety. I don't say verity, although I say varies. I divide between the I and the E when I say variety. And the word that's translated in these various ways in 1 Corinthians is the word that in grammar is used to separate between the I and the E in variety so that each has its own distinct role and clarity of meaning. Later on, in verse 11, Paul will actually use the verb that takes us back to the language of distribution. As the same spirit distributes to each as it wishes. So perhaps you'd like to cross out variety and write in distribution because the two words are there associated with each other. But bear in mind these other associations, these other ideas that it evokes, that these gifts are not just a medley, that they are given because the Spirit distributes. And if the Spirit distributes, then there is some sort of planning. There is some sort of allocation. Yes, there is diversity. There is difference, and difference needs thinking about and recognizing and celebrating. And there is division because sometimes division makes clear and allows the different components, the different elements to each be heard. what do we mean by distribution or diversity or, dis or, or variety? Back to our toilet rolls again. It looks to me in that picture as if what the supermarket has done has distributed their wares, first of, first of all according to manufacturer and then according to colour, which is fine if when you choose your toilet rolls, you always go for a particular colour by a particular manufacturer. So quite why that should be your principle of choice of toilet rolls slightly defeats me. It may be, of course, that what you would prefer is to have the recycled ones on one side of the aisle and the ones which aren't recycled on the other side of the aisle. And at least then you could make your first decision. And then, hopefully, when you went to the ones which weren't recycled, if indeed any of you do that, <laughs> you would at least go to the div division between those which are made from forest-friendly paper and those which, if there are any such, and which I'm sure no one here would choose, are not made from forest-friendly paper. And then, of course, according to your preferences, or perhaps your budget, you might go between those which are quilted and those which are not quilted. And then for some reason, which is even more beyond my understanding, you might go for those which have an emblem on their quilting and from those which do have no emblem on their quilting. And if the supermarket presented their toilet rolls in this way, you would know exactly what you were going for and why? Because it would be distributed or divided. Now, a rather more familiar pattern of doing precisely that will be the sort of pattern that you will be familiar with if you are a biologist, or perhaps if you are a bird watcher, or perhaps if you love going out into nature, and you begin to divide what you see 
according to their families and according to their species and according to their genus. Because the word that Paul used and that we've seen could be translated as variety or could be translated as distribution or diversity or even division is the word that was used in order to analyze or break down what you had in front of you in order to decide what it is and what it is not. In the same way as within the natural world, we can divide things into their species and their genus by the characteristics that they share and by the characteristics that they do not share. That's the process, in a sense, that is behind Paul's language of distribution. So that what we are seeing is not things that are in opposition to each other, not things that are defined by being other than and therefore exclusive to because you don't have anything to do with it, but things which are de defined both by their sameness as well as by their difference. Things which are defined because they belong to the same shared set of characteristics by the same family to which they belong as well as by those things which have been given to them that makes them distinct. And that perhaps if we were to push this analogy from nature makes them flourish in particular contexts for particular purposes, for particular ways. And yet although this is an image of difference, it is also an image of togetherness. It is also an image of belonging. It is rather, in some ways, like the image that Paul then goes on to explore in the second half of chapter 12, where he explores the image of the body, which each element within it, whether it be hand or foot, eye or whatever, has its own particular role, its own distinctive characteristics, developed for a particular purpose, but which actually belongs to the single body here, which actually belongs to the single family. So I'm not sure how clear that is. So if you want another different sort of image of it, and here an image which is shown not so much in terms of, of your acacia divided into its different species and different uh, types of genus, uh, here is actually an image which originally was supposed to say something, I think, about evolution, but never mind. It shows again how you get diversity arising from unity. And those of you who know not only the language of genus and species and family, but how you can push back from that again and, and again, you'll know that one of the earliest stages is, in fact, kingdom. Kingdom. The diversity is rooted in and emerges out of a unity. But at the same time, the diversity has its origins in, its rooting in, and goes back to, points to, the unity, the oneness from which it became. That is all captured in the language that Paul uses in that verse four of there are distributions, diversities, divisions, varieties of gifts. No longer your quality street box, 
offered something actually rather more intentional and rather more holistic. There are then, for the moment, let me use the language of divisions. There are then divisions of gifts. But the trouble with the language of gift is that we know how easily open it is to abuse. How easy it is to say, I've got given this, you haven't. Or how easy it is to see, to say, as we see very visibly, tragically, in the Middle East, but how often elsewhere, this has been given to me, or us, and therefore it is our inalienable right, and nobody else has any sort of part in it. I am the recipient, you cannot be. So having lang introduced the language of gift, Paul pushes on. And he goes on to say, there are varieties of services. Now when you move from the language of gifts to services, services to others, both those who are within and those who are outside, you begin to have to rethink the language of gifts. So having had to rethink what is pneumatic to the language of gift, you have to now rethink the language of gift to the language of service, which is perhaps not quite so easy to abuse as the language of service. And then he pushes on again there are distributions of, I've put energies, the NRSV still using the language of varieties, of activities. Language now which shows that we're not just talking about something which is perhaps a little passive, but something which is active, which is purposeful, which is achieving, which has goals. You don't sit back with your gifts and twiddle your thumbs. If they are energies, if they are going somewhere. So Paul has now begun to make you rethink what you thought you knew you had or were talking about. But are these gifts these servant services, these energies, are they different or are they the same names, different names for the same things? Are some things gifts and other things services and other things energies? Are some people distributed gifts and other people distributed services and other people distributed energies? Or are these different perspectives on the same? And the passage can actually be read in both ways because later on when Paul begins to spell these things out, he will use the language of gifts again about the specific. There are gifts of healing something that is not given to everybody. And yet clearly, if somebody is able to exercise it, is self-evidently given a gift, not a capacity of all. And later on, he will talk about there being energies, energies of powerful acts, Things that perhaps particularly reflect the powerfulness of what comes from God. So Paul does use the language of gifts and of energies about the specific, about some and not about others. 
But notice that he does not use services as relating to the specific. He talks about gifts of healing. He talks about energies of powerful acts. In the NRSV, by the way, that's the working of miracles, which I think is a bit, again, a bit flat uh, and a bit too narrow. But he does not turn services into the specific. He does not say there are just a few things that are services, there are just a few people for whom that is true. Divisions of gifts, the same spirit. Varieties of services, the same Lord. Distributions of energies, the same God. Paul had as such no doctrine of the Trinity as we would know it, know it from later De the theological development. But Paul thinks in a triune way. Paul has experienced God in a triune way. And so has a triune way of thinking. And just as God is experienced in this threefold way, yet with a unity of being and a unity of purpose, so these different gifts, services, energies reflect both the triune nature of God and the oneness of God's will and God's purpose. There is then both, if you want, diversity and unity in God which is the source of any sort of diversity and unity which is found in God's people. But notice again how Paul has not just chosen these in some sort of haphazard way. The varieties of service point to the same Lord. And so you should in your mind be taken back, and I'm not saying that Paul knew this verse precisely, but he knew what lay behind it. You should be taken back to something like Mark 10, verse 45, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Service, serving, has been the fundamental model which is associated with Jesus, whether through that verse or through the story of the washing of the feet or in John 13 or in so many other ways, is not accidentally associated with the same Lord. And so when in the next part of the chapter you move on to a different sort of image, to the image of the body of Christ, the body of the same Lord, then the set of associations that you will take with you is that of service. Characterized by service as members of the body of Christ. A variety or division of energies of power, but the same God, the same God who energizes all things among all. So on that last slide, the energies associated with God are also appropriate to God. Because God is the dynamic source of all. God is the one who energizes 
all things. God is the creative source of all. All things among all. 